timing of the emergency food waivers during this pandemic. And now we can switch gears and launch straight into our morning panel. And that is titled, Local Innovation is Key to Food Security in Times of Crisis. Now there's nothing more important right now than understanding how things are done at a local level. Although these two programs are miles apart and approach this work very differently from all aspects, they both make healthy food a priority. They serve rural areas of Montana, and they're not only serving their communities and the surrounding area, they're reaching the hard to reach kids and families, as well as the high risk families and serving every, everyone with dignity and respect. So the panel will showcase a project under Fast Blackfeet, serving the Blackfeet Nation, and we're honored to have the following two panelists join us. First, we have Noni Wolf, the board chair at Fast Blackfeet, and on the design team for Mount Peck. And although she's technically retired, everyone, <laughs> Noni continues to dedicate her life to food security. Noni is a registered dietitian and has created a series of cooking classes for the Indian Health Services that were published and used by nutritionists throughout the nation to teach healthy cooking for diabetes. Then we have Kim Paul, founder, of the, founder and executive director of Pakani Lodge Health Institute, a native nonprofit focused on health and well-being. Kim is a long-standing member of the Blackfeet Traditional Societies and Ceremony, and she has dedicated her life to community. Kim serves on an advisory board for the National Institute of Health, focusing on the reduction of chronic diseases and health disparities in Indian country. The panel will showcase a school meal operation in Huntley Project School in Warden, Montana. And we're so fortunate to have the following two panelists join us. We have Ginger Buchanan, the School Nutrition Director at Huntley Project School, and she's going on her fourth year in this role. She's also a farm to school coach for T Montana Team Nutrition. She coaches food service directors all over Montana by encouraging them to serve more local foods, make more food from scratch, and take advantage of USDA programs like Harvest of the Month. The best part of all, I think, is that Ginger's background is in ranching. We also have Kelly Jones, head cook at Huntley Project Schools. Kelly has been in this role for five years and in the, in, in the head cook position, sorry, for three years. And she is dedicated, hard work, hardworking, a team player, and a firm believer in feeding kids the best quality food, no matter how difficult. And finally, the facilitator for this panel is Shelley Sutherland, who is the Community Coalition Coordinator for Big Hound, uh, Bighorn, sorry, County um, Best Beginnings. Shelley has worked with community-based wellness and resiliency programs for the past 15 years. More recently, her work is focused on improving early childhood systems, family support, substance use disorder, chronic disease prevention, and promoting healthful, active communities. And I've had the opportunity to serve with Shelly on our design team for Mount Peck. Her experience in the health sector always shines through and helps us understand the interplay between food insecurity and social determinants of health. So Shelly, I'll hand it over to you now to facilitate the panel. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Um, and hey, everybody. Um, it's good to see you. Thanks for joining us. And um, I know that you're in for a real treat. I know this because I got a, a sneak preview yesterday um, of the two programs. Um, and it's always so inspiring to hear about the real grassroots community wellness efforts that are happening around our state. Um, but even more impressive is to be able to see the hearts behind that work. And so um, I'm really excited about the, the two the speakers today. Um, we're going to start off with an overview of each project. So Noni and Kim will talk about their collaborative work with um, emergency food. And then uh, Ginger and Kelly will talk about um, their innovative work with school meals in Warden. And after that, I'll um, ask a couple of questions and um, then we'll take questions from the whole group. As folks are speaking, feel free to pop your questions into the chat. We'll have several people monitoring that um, and we'll try to get through all of your questions in the hour that we have. Um, so Noni, take it away. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you, Shelly. 
Back in the day, prior to moving to Browning, I worked for the training center in Santa Fe, and I used to stand up in front of people, all different size groups, reservations, and national conferences, and do presentations. And I, used, I must be getting old, and I'm terribly out of practice because this makes me uh, very nervous. But I'm very excited to talk about our um, Fast Blackfeet, Fast Standing for Food Access and Sustainability team <clears throat> here at Blackfeet. Our elevator speech kind of is that Fast Blackfeet's a nonprofit that envisions a healthy, strong, and food secure Blackfeet nation founded by a group of community leaders, health professionals, educators, and involved citizens. Fast Blackfeet invests in Blackfeet nation communities by decreasing food insecurity, improving healthy food access, providing nutrition education for reservation citizens, and addressing food sovereignty to ensure culturally relevant and affordable food for all. So when we're talking about food security and food sovereignty, the slide shows you our definitions of what we consider that to be. So the short walk forward um, and is that um, we, were, we were founded in um, 2016 and we conducted a food, community food security and food sovereignty assessment that showed us that two of every three people um, in our reservation communities have some degree of food insecurity or hunger. Now we know because of COVID that that is much higher. And when we have people coming through our pantry, we have um, some of the folks that report that they've been there before, but we always have um, eight or more new people who've not been to the pantry before. The statistics we found from our um, CFSA, or our Community Food Security and Food Sovereignty Assessment, have been used to help other programs um, in our community um, gain funding for their work. We became a nonprofit in June of 2018. And during the summer of that time, Medicine Bear Shelter, which is a tribal program here that feeds lunch um, weekly to um, those that need it, they invited us to join them in their building. And so we occupy the bottom part of it that has the driveway in front, and that's where our pantry is. January 2019, we hired an AmeriCorps worker, Andrew Brokaw, um, to set up our food pantry and um, opened our food pantry in September of 2019. So we just turned a year old. Um, Montana Food Bank Network was a great assistance to us in helping us with best practices and learning what we needed to do um, to be a, a, a good food pantry. January 2020, now um, we've hired. Mackenzie Sachs, and she's an AmeriCorps worker for our second year to do our nutrition education program and um, look at traditional food practices in our community. We hope to ultimately have a community food resource center, food access being the first part of that, which is opening the pantry, but then also knowing that we have to help people cook from scratch and learn how to eat foods from the pantry. We're developing a nutrition education aspect of this and have had two online nutrition education um, classes happen that Mackenzie and Danielle Antelope have been leading. So that will be growing. We had hoped to be doing classes and cooking classes and education classes and things like that, but uh, COVID put the skids to that. So then COVID hit us March 2020. And um, even though it's been tremendously hard, it's actually been a, a great, um, gift too, because it's moved us forward in our plans very, very quickly. Prior to COVID, we had a manpower. We worked with manpower, which is a tribal program, and, and we had um, on-the-job training um, workers to run the pantry. And um, in April of 2020, we lost our second worker, and so we were without a lead. Mackenzie Sachs, um, go back, okay, sorry. Things like slide changing just makes my mind go out. Um, Mackenzie Sachs and I and five, <clears throat> four other board members ran the pantry in April because we had no pantry manager. So, and I had really no experience with that. Uh, so we got in there and developed inventory forms and received foods and moved cases of food around and um, Chuck and Vicki Holbrook 
came in. Chuck's really good at building things. He built us a really nice table with casters on it to use to make boxes on. And COVID changed our distribution. We used to walk people through the pantry and help them select the foods and then take their boxes. And when COVID hit, we could no longer let them in the building. Medicine Bear closed. And so we basically took over their whole building. We were upstairs in their dining, but we were hauling boxes up and down the stairs. And Chuck came in and said, why are we doing that? Why don't we just open the garage door and do it all from downstairs? So we converted and we have a line of cars that drive up. They pull up, they call us, give us their name and their family size. And then we develop the box. Um, we, we make four kinds, one to two size families, um, three to four, six to seven, and then eight plus. We have some families that have like 10 or more people. And um, so then our workers, our volunteers, take the box out to the table and then the people load it into their car. Um, so that was how COVID changed that. And then um, I was, our uh, co-chair, Danielle Antelope, is going to school at MSU. And she was done for the year. And I thought, I wonder if Danielle needs a summer job. So I approached her to run our food pantry. And boy, I tell you what, we moved forward quite quickly. Um, it pays to have someone work for you that has experience with just what they're working on. <laughs> so up to that time, we were ordering food from the Montana Food Bank every six weeks to cover our needs. So we'd have a real full pantry and then the food would kind of go down. And then just before the next load would come, we'd be like almost bare bones. And um, um, we got the tea fat food and we were really, really grateful for all that we were getting. Um, and um, so then this is a picture of our oil food pantry and it's a little different picture than what we've become. So we'll stay here for a second and I'll tell you something about our statistics. In uh, February of 2020, uh, from February 2020 to July, the number of people coming through our pantry increased about 3.6 times. And um, we figured that, that for every one person that comes and picks up food, there's about 4.5 people that we're actually feeding. So that kind of gives you an idea of the numbers that we have. I looked at our average numbers, and prior to March, the average number of people who came to our pantry on a distribution day, which is a Monday or a Thursday from 3 to 5.30. And people can come. There's no income requested. They can come to the pantry um, and get a box, but only once a week. And so we have 20 to 40 people every time we open the door. Um, the week before COVID in March, we had 48 people at the last distribution. The last three distributions of March, remember that's when COVID hit, we had 91, 126, and 97 people come to the door. And so then I looked at our average numbers. April, it was 158. And at that time, we added out-of-town boxes that were delivered um, by um, the Bakani Lodge Health Institute, which is the program Kim Paul leads. We, um, she and I were talking with Bonnie Sachitella Sawyer from Hopa Mountain and Patty Grubb, who runs the, who leads the food pantry in Cupbank, which is just off the reservation. And Kim happened to mention that she, um, her program was taking hot lunches to the elders out in the communities because they couldn't drive into town, we were protecting them. And um, so they were staying at home and we found out that a lot of them are head of households. So they had these families that no food was coming to, but they were getting a hot meal. So we collaborated with them and they gave us a list of how many people and the size families, and then we developed the boxes. So in April, that brought our average distribution day size to 158 and then 169 in May, 128 in June, 153 in July and 164 in August. So when we look at pounds of food in February, the total pounds of food we gave out was about 4,300. And then in the last six months, the average pounds of food we've distributed out of our pantry is 34,073. So we grew very quickly <laughs> in a very short time. And it was really crazy because in March, Bonnie Thanatello Sawyer called and she said, I'd like you to fill out this grant uh, for $10,000 and we, so we can help you ramp up for COVID. You know, it's like, ramp up for COVID? What do you mean? <laughs> Little did I know 
and she asked us for what we needed. And um, so then we started seeing all these people coming to the door and it became really apparent that what we needed was to start buying food and obtaining food. Most of the food that we got um, initially, we worked with the North Valley Food Bank and the Kalispell Food Bank and Montana Food Bank Network, and we got a lot of um, uh, donations. So initially, primary amount of the food that we were serving was through that. And um, we learned about grant writing. We started putting in for grants and the importance of the relationships that you build and establish and maintain with funders. Um, and some of that was through the training. Hopa Mountain did a really good gathering and, and did some training um, that we participated in. Locally in our, our community, there was a COVID wellness group established and it was all different programs. So we were able to get on that Zoom meeting, talk about what we've been doing so people got to know us and got to know um, um, people got to know sorry the chat just threw me off I'm old I can't do this doing very good okay so um, with the wellness group we were looking at people that were supplying PPE people that were um, um, Oh, what else were they doing? PPE, feeding, we talked about the food aspects, um, health, mental health, um, and COVID education. So there was a whole bunch of information and it was being collaborated in this group and they were happening meetings every couple of weeks. It was really great. So we got um, Danielle on and, and she agreed to be our pantry manager. And of course we were paying, we decided to pay her. So right there in April we hired a pantry manager and she was working with Scott Brandt who was with Blackfeet Nourish and one of our board members who helped do ordering of food because Scott initially used to come over every two weeks and through Blackfeet Nourish he'd bring a thousand pounds of food to Medicine Bear and um, that we would use that food and so he kept doing that until COVID hit and he couldn't travel anymore. Um, Danielle organized food rescue from our local grocery stores, um, and we decided that we, since we couldn't cover the amount of food we needed, we needed to um, just in one big load every six weeks, we did weekly smaller distributions, and that's when North Valley Food Bank um, was coming every Friday and delivering food. Um, so Mackenzie and, and Danielle worked um, on the food pantry, collecting the volunteers. And Danielle came to the board and said, you know, we need someone to coordinate the volunteers. We find that that's the one thing that's hard to do with all the other things we're doing. And Mackenzie being an AmeriCorps VISTA worker could only work in the capacity of the food pantry until June. And then she had to go back to her VISTA duties. Um, and then Danielle also was um, instrumental in um, writing letters to the tribe and saying you guys should be helping us we're feeding a lot of people and also talk day to day with the Blackfeet food distribution and food bank the tribe also has a food bank um, but they work differently than we do we're a gap program so people's benefits run out or if they're an emergency situation all of a sudden they get a you know a, um, six kids that come to live with them um, because of something else that happens in the family and they need more food, they can come to us and get a box of food. There's no income criteria and no questions asked. And people are very grateful for that. Um, the, the food distribution program is the FDPIR, but they also have a food bank, but they collect donations and then they'll do like a distribution of the food items that they get. We develop boxes so people can make um, healthy meals for four to five days. Um, Okay, so that and along with this slide, this shows our pantry manager. Danielle also trained um, Cindy Salloway, who is our pantry manager, and she's pictured up in the uh, corner, um, left top corner, and our volunteer coordinator. And then along the um, going clockwise, that's what our pantry looks like now. And actually, that isn't our pantry. Um, Medicine Bear has decided to do some construction and they're enlarging our space. So since they're doing construction, we moved across the street 
to the Browning United Methodist Church, and that's their annex. So we have filled up their annex with our food and taken um, what used to be the clothing bank, which doesn't operate anymore, and made it into our offices. So we've been living there since September. Um, and um, Danielle Antelope is over here on the right, um, helping to make boxes. So since she's finished with school for this first semester, she's volunteering at the um, pantry and is making boxes there. And that table used to be a big, long table that we took apart and cut in half and Chuck made it mobile. So one day Medicine Bear came down. They told us we could have it, but they came down and said, what happened to that big table? He said, there it is over there. <laughs> it's much easier to use now. <laughs> okay. So, um, and then in the middle is a picture of last summer, um, Keith and Jen Janelle, and, sorry, Heather. Um, and then they picked up the boxes and with, with their pickup trucks. And so they would go and then take it and then come back and get some more. So that's, um, when we had the big farm to family boxes coming to town, um, you know, the semi would roll in with like 900 boxes. And sometimes it would not, we wouldn't know ahead of time definitely when it was coming. Um, but it luckily, some days it was on distribution days. So we'd go over and get enough for our distribution, bring it back. And so we'd have produce and dairy in it. And we'd add frozen meat and some canned products. And we're able to use some of those for our distribution. And um, when we get deliveries, we may have like 14 pallets. With this particular building, we can't drive into um, with, a, with a, there's no door for the forklift. So we put the pallets on the ground outside and then the fire cache comes over with 15 guys and they take the pallets apart, take them inside and put them back together. Um, and um, we get 11 to 14 pallets whenever we have a delivery. Okay, so um, I, I didn't see, oh, one next slide. Just quickly, moving into the future, this morning, we got a new van. We applied for the one in June with the Montana COVID. We were able to get $50,000. And then we had um, four other donors that added additional funding and we were able to purchase this new van. And I had hoped to have a nice picture of it, but it showed up at nine o'clock this morning, I understand. And um, we've started a new program because the County Lodge Health Institute the work with them showed us just how much need it was. And they're serving elder head of households. We serve, um, we always count the number of adults, children, and elders in our program. So we've been serving all of those all along. And we expect to pick up some younger head of household families um, when we start going out. So, um, okay, the next slide. And this is my contact information. and. Um, I knew this would happen. Yesterday I did this in three minutes. Today I'm way over. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kim to tell her part of the story. Thank you. Thank you, Noni. Well spoken. Oki Nixukweks, Nistuni Taniko Misami Ma Sipse Puyaki, Nistu Amskapi Pitani Gi Iokamikski Kanaksemi Dax. Hello everyone. Um, my traditional name is Longtime Charging Woman. Um, I'm a member of the uh, Amskapi Pikani, which is what people commonly know as the Blackfeet tribe. We are the southernmost um, tribe of a four tribe nation. We were divided by the medicine line um, uh, about 100 years ago. Uh, and three of our tribes remain up north beyond the Canadian, what's now known as the Canadian border. We're just really honored and privileged to be doing this work. Um, we initially began in March, understanding the reality of COVID as it spread globally. Um, uh, we, uh, at that time, um, and always will be a nonprofit that serves uh, more in health research and reducing health disparities in Indian country. Um, we're a team that's made up now of 11 employees uh, ranging from the Bitterroot. We have a dear friend in the Bitterroot who does um, just great work with us side by side, shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm. Um, 
along with uh, the rest of our team that's here located uh, on the Blackfeet Nation, within the Blackfeet Nation. Um, our original mission for uh, uh, Pikani Lodge and, and remains to today is um, that we're founded and led, uh, native founded and led nonprofit organization focusing on translational strengths such as improved community economics, adaptation to a changing climate, health promotion and disease reduction through bench science and the reclamation and integration of our traditional and cultural lifeways while expanding our connection to the land and its biosystems. So very sciencey, very um, hands-on, but when uh, COVID began spreading our way to America, our team sat down and um, had a meeting and we, we really um, <clears throat> understood by the mortality rate spreading across China and Europe that um, we were under uh, great stress as an isolated community with less than equitable um, healthcare, like much of rural Montana, and um, took a vote, uh, uh, PLHI, Pakani Lodge Health Institute vote um, amongst us and decided that we would serve our um, 11 sub-communities uh, within 1.5 million acres um, and put our regular work aside until we could um, increase the level of safety for our elders, um, for those most, uh, um, that would be the hardest hit by this, this virus. And so we felt that our elders, our mobility and immunocompromised would be our target there. And in reaching out to, um, uh, Eagle Shields, which is our local senior citizen uh, food provider, um, we arranged to deliver meals for them. They arranged to ramp up um, what they were normally serving daily as 100 meals to 300. And we deliver, beginning March 16th, we began delivering out 197 meals to um, all of our sub-community elders, anyone over 65. And so by this outreach, then um, we began a collaboration with Oyoke Food Pantry and Noni um, in delivering out family food boxes because we saw such a need not only to serve the elders in those homes, but many grandparents raising grandchildren or multiple families, you know, within one home unit. Um, and so uh, there was a beautiful collaboration that began. We um, initially had zero dollars to do this. We couldn't, you know, dip into any of our other um, projects for anything like that. So we put a button on our website, um, a donation button, and um, people just beautifully across the globe began donating $10, $20. Um, to date, we've received $18,000 in donations. We delivered um, close to 46,000 hot meals over 40,000 miles in the last eight months with our own personal vehicles. So we've been able to pay um, a team of deliverers. We usually have four out delivering every day because we have such ground to cover. Um, and we've been able to provide a payroll for them to the degree that uh, um, it's 1.5 FTE as opposed to one. So we're real, we're real proud of that because they, you know, going to 197 homes a day are frontline workers. And, and initially we didn't have the money, we had to pay them just, you know, uh, 1.0 FTE. And so we're really proud that we're able to up that, that payroll and also cover their mileage. Um, we were <clears throat> uh, floundering there for a bit and our beautiful state of Montana came out with the COVID relief opportunities, funding opportunities. So we put in for the food pantry for payroll and mileage. We received that, we put in for the business, business innovation because we also saw that it took us two weeks to get an accurate count of our elders and, and their locations. And so we developed a, an emergency food strategic plan for getting food and medicines um, out into our community, um, as well as getting people in for dialysis, et cetera. So we're just about to complete that by the 1230 deadline, the end of the year. And, just um, have been really proud to collaborate with Noni and, and with the good people at Fast Blackfeet and at the Oyoke Food Pantry. Um, I think that uh, from this, we've also developed a local producer's card. We realize that, that um, we are not a closed system and we're very dependent upon external sources for food and that we, can, uh, that we need to do better at providing locally. And so we um, did a mass outreach to our local producers. And so we now have a food directory 
of local producers that ranges everywhere from chickens and hens and eggs and produce to about um, 40 cattle producers um, with contact lists um, for folks locally to reach out for food on their own if they're able to afford it. And so that's been real helpful and, and provides a little more stability to our community in the event that we have a natural disaster or that the food lines are cut off. So it's a step in the right direction. Um, we're, we're very grassroots and I think that a lot of our work will be ending um, December 30th unless other funding or needs come in and we'll get back to our, our bench science-y uh, work. But just an example of how a community can jump in and meet the needs um, that we saw, we, we knew that our elder population and our immunocompromised and mobility compromised would be most at risk. And, and so that's where we targeted our outreach. Um, thank you guys for your time. And I hope that uh, to take any questions after a bit. Thanks so much, Kim and Noni. That's, it's so great to hear about those spontaneous collaboration efforts, um, all for a good cause and, and supporting communities. Thank you so much. Now I'm gonna um, turn it over to Ginger and Kelly, and Ginger's gonna tell us about her um, innovative uh, food meals program. Hey everybody, my name's Ginger Buchanan. Kelly and I are very happy to be here today. I'm the food service director for Huntley Project School in Warden, Montana. And yes, I talk a little funny. So I'm from the South, in case you were wondering. <laughs> I'm also a farm to school coach for Montana Team Nutrition. I want to thank Montana Partnership to End Childhood Hunger for the opportunity to speak to you today. When preparing for this talk, I was trying to decide exactly what I want, to, want you to take away from this. And that is, you can still accomplish your goals even during COVID-19 and save money doing it. I'd like to talk about how we were able to overcome the problems COVID presented to us and how you can too. First of all, here at Huntley Project School Kitchen, our main number one goal is to provide our students and staff with healthy, nutritious, good tasting, made from scratch or semi made from scratch food that they will eat and enjoy. I love this goal. I love this challenge and I love my job. Let me tell you why. My boss or superintendent is, a, is an amazing human being. He allows me to be creative and implement my ideas. I have a lot of them. <laughs> he doesn't fence me in. He trusts my decisions and knows anything I do here is for the betterment of the student body and our community. Because of that, I can dream big. As a food service director at Huntley Project School, I am responsible for the daily meals provided to the students and staff. We provide breakfast, lunch, snacks for our after school program, and the backpack program. The backpack program allows students in need to take home enough meals to last them through the weekend, ensuring our students don't go hungry. In meeting our goals for providing healthy meals, we plan our menu for one month in advance. We order the ingredients we need for that week's menu weekly. If we're introducing an entree that we feel the younger students will be hesitant to try, we make plans to go to the classrooms to introduce that meal by doing taste tests. The younger ones love this, and they're more likely to eat that meal when it's served. Again, making sure our students can participate in school and not feel hungry. The recipes we use or the meal plan that day may have come from one of my recipes used at home one of my staff member makes at home, or maybe just a good meal that the students request again and again. Again, I'd like to emphasize, our meals are made mainly from scratch or semi-made from scratch. On the screen there, you can see the cinnamon rolls that Kelly right here, she's the all-star. <laughs> she made those <laughs> and they're very famous. <laughs> we have done away with the heat and serve menus or the number 10 can special. Is it more work? Yes. Is it better tasting, more nutritious, more gratifying, and cheaper? Yes. Me nor my head cook Kelly like to stand in front of an oven all day putting frozen chicken patties on sheet pans. Instead, we would rather be moving around the kitchen, grabbing spices and ingredients, putting something wonderful together in the tilt skillet or the steam kettle. 
We love the creativity involved in it and we enjoy making a good meal. There's a lot of pride involved in it and our students love it. Then comes COVID. Yes, just like the rest of you, COVID-19 had a tremendous impact on our kitchen and meal planning. I'd be the first to admit this has been challenging at times. Our pre-COVID meals had basically come to a halt. No longer were we whipping out things like chicken cordon bleu casserole, Italian pasta bake, pork chops and gravy over rice, or even meals we normally made for breakfast like French toast made from, from Kelly's French bread or our pancakes, etc. Not only was our quality of food served impacted, but we had to deal with number one, new rules regarding serving our meals. Number two, packaging our meals. Number three, having to shut down our kitchen due to a staff member having COVID. Number four, when we were shut down, having to plan to feed the kids while we were quarantined. That was a tough one. Number five, losing staff when their daycare closed due to COVID and they couldn't find sitters. And the, the big one for us to deal with was number six, storage. Our freezers were packed with frozen prepackaged hoagies, uncrustables, and individual packaged waffles, and et cetera, et cetera. Our dry storage was filled with potato chips, prepackaged muffins, and anything else we could think to serve that was prepackaged. As far as how we got these meals to the kids, we had seven bus routes, and the kids were also allowed to come here to the school and pick up meals. Now, all those setbacks led to us desperately needing to make changes. Our kitchen had become chaotic and cramped. In order to make those changes, we needed money. Where did we find the money? During COVID, I have found that there is a lot of grant money out there. You would be surprised just how much money is available by filling out a short form. We were able to purchase a $31,000 Oliver food packaging machine that brought us back to serving those pre-COVID meals. And you can see what that Oliver system on your screen there. Um, because of that machine, well, first of all, because of the grant, and secondly, the machine, you know, our kids are back to eating normal home-cooked meals. We were also able to buy a 10 by 16 external freezer that helped with storage problems. These corporations want to help you and the opportunities are all around us for new equipment, delivery costs, funding staff, extra storage and cleaning supplies, transportation and anything your kitchen needs that you can think of is available right now. Any challenge you are facing right now, there is help out there for you through grants. I'm also always looking for new opportunities for our school kitchen. I have subscribed to the Chef Ann Institute. Her foundation is there to help food service directors with recipes, production, and procurement, and grant opportunities. I even won a little kid salad bar through one of her grants, pre-COVID. She also gives training scholarships as well. And right now I'm urgently waiting to see if we won, a, won one of those. I also get emails through No Kid Hungry and Albertsons. I get farm to school grant information through USDA. To date, we have applied and won over $100,000 in grant money that helped us to be able to um, serve our kids made from scratch meals. I would like to talk a bit about other ways we save money here at Huntley Project. This kitchen's budget was in the red for several years. On my hire date, I was challenged with the task of saving money and putting this kitchen back in the black. I took it very seriously. My administration signed me up for the very first Cook Fresh Institute class that was developed by Montana Team Nutrition and No Kid Hungry. First year food service directors were asked to participate in this week long class to learn more made from scratch tips and tricks. I learned a ton about cooking from scratch and how it saves a great deal of money. During that week long training, I also learned that colleges like MSU sometimes have surplus items that they auction off. One of the items that MSU had at that time was three bulk milk dispensers like you see on the screen. 
We applied and were blessed by MSU donating not one, but all three of their surplus dispensers. By using those, we were able to save not only the cost of new ones, but an additional $8,500 a year by not serving carton milk. The kids loved it and say the milk tastes better and it serve yourself all they want. Now that was pre-COVID. Right now we had to go back to carton milk, but one day when we finally get back to the way things were, we're going right back to those milk dispensers. After completing my first year, I was pulled into the office and told not only were we in the black, but we were to the good $55,000. A huge credit to that was because we cut costs by not only cooking from scratch, but also using local vendors. I have purchased steers from local ranchers, a trout from Flathead Lake, bread from Wheat, Montana, and lettuce from Swanky Roots, among many others. By purchasing local, we can accomplish several, several things. One, we are supporting local producers in Montana. Two, our students are educated as to where their food here at Huntley Project comes from. Three, it's healthier. We know what's in it. And four, we get better deals through negotiation of price. And that's one thing I love to do is negotiate. <laughs> Through my part-time position with Montana Teen Nutrition, I've, I've been blessed with some pretty amazing experiences by, research, by researching local vendors and helping out other food service directors. I have toured local ranches, greenhouses, and a Flathead Lake natural fish hatchery. I have learned that in order to find local foods, you just have to do a little searching. I have found so many local vendors who are more than happy to be involved with feeding our kids in schools. The meal wa waivers that the government has extended has helped us with meal costs as well. Through the extensions, every kid in our school can get free meals even through the summer feeding program. I love involving my kitchen staff in every aspect of our operation here at Huntley Project. I love having them find and create new recipes. Involving everyone gives them ownership and pride in their jobs. I involve them in every decision I have to make from creating menus to lessons in the classroom and serving taste tests in the classrooms. We have a very happy and enthusiastic crew. I think it's so important to keep the atmosphere positive and not sweat the small stuff. And that starts with me. It's my responsibility to set the mood here in our workplace. We not only work well together, we play well together. The only reason you're not hearing laughter in the background is because me and Kelly threatened them to be quiet while we were doing this in here. <laughs> the kitchen's right there. <laughs> we're a team. Our good times aren't just limited to the kitchen during work hours. We make a point to go on team building outings. The mystery house is a good one. That's where you have to work together in order to escape. <laughs> I was asked to speak a little on my career goals. Right now, I'm very happy with my position here at Huntley Project. I love this school and I wanna complete my mission with upgrading our kitchen and meals we provide. I am very excited about some new equipment I have ordered through the grants we've won. I'm waiting on two smokers, one indoor and one portable. The portable one, it, there's an example on your screen right there. Um, that one is from Greenville, South Carolina, and uh, they have a barbecue team, but that smoker smokes all their, their um, USDA uh, pork roasts, and they smoke chicken on there, and I wish I had some pictures for that because it's mouth-watering, and that's what we're getting. Um, <laughs> With these, we can, we can, I told you about the chicken and the pork. Um, with a portable smoker, we can do fundraisers and be involved with community outreach projects. We still more, need more storage space and a delivery vehicle. So I'll be looking for more funding for those items. In closing, there are more opportunities to learn more and be ed engaged in farm to school initiatives. Montana Team Nutrition Program is currently collecting recipes that feature local foods in the Harvesting Montana Recipes Contest until January 15. This spring, Montana Team Nutrition will be hosting two more virtual Montana Farm to School showcases. Once they are scheduled, the information will, 
will be posted to the Montana Farm to School Training and Events webpage and Facebook page. The recordings of our past showcases include the tour of Huntley Project's kitchen and are on that page in the archive section. I will be leading a Montana School Kitchen Tour session at the Montana Farm to School Summit, which is planned for August 2021 in Helena. Workshop proposals are currently being accepted for the summit until December 31st, which is a great way to share your farm to school experience so others can learn from you. Conference registration will open later this winter. Follow Montana Farm to School on Facebook for upcoming events and information. If you would like my help with any of your farm to school projects or made from scratch cooking, please feel free to email me. My contact information will be available through this webinar. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Ginger. You guys are amazing. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I have some questions for everybody, but before I let you get away, I've got to ask, um, how did you serve food during the time when your staff was quarantined? How were you able to keep your program going? So I kind of had a backup plan early on for fear that that was going to happen. Um, we did have about two days worth of food in the freezer that you would just pull, pull out, fall, and put some bags together. Um, but for the two weeks that we were quarantined, um, we hired a outside local vendor and she came in and used our kitchen and just, she hit the ground running. So we had that kind of planned as a backup. She knew about it, you know, ever since March. And so when it came time to use her, she was ready. Good. Wow. Yeah, you were right on top of that. <laughs> but our food was better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I missed that, Kelly. Oh, said it again. I said, but our food was better. <laughs> well, undoubtedly. Yeah, of course. There was a question earlier in the chat about willingness to share recipes. Is Absolutely. That yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I think, um, Shelly, do y'all have my contact information posted anywhere? Um, I can put it in the chat box. People can email me. That'd be great. Yeah, if you could throw it in the chat box. Um, one of the questions I was going to ask was about funding. That's always an issue of great interest um, in our state. Um, but I think you all talked a fair amount about funding. Um, did we miss anything? Are there any other sources of funding that you would want to talk about, Noni, Kim? Um, I, I could make a comment. I, um, <clears throat> we've had funding that we've received for COVID relief. Little Shell Tribe, because many of their tribal members live here, um, was really gracious in helping us. And um, of course, our van, we got um, through COVID relief and support for our program. The other thing is um, we're moving forward and we've got three grants for food pharmacy programs because one of the things about giving food pantry boxes is it's, it's good to have the food, but we have a lot of people in our community with diabetes, hypertension. Um, we have children who are at risk for um, chronic problems that might come from being overweight. And so we are in the process of establishing work with the hospital and the Southern Pagan Health Clinic to, and we'll be hiring a dietitian. We are um, going to offer MNT services, but our part of it is that we get a referral and we're designing a special food box for people with special health needs. And so they'll be able to get a box for their, themselves. And since we know if they're food insecure, because they're going to start screening them for it at the clinic, then if they're food insecure, we know their family is too. So they'll get a box for the patient and then they'll also get a family box from us. Um, so in those funders, the funders for that is the Good Health and Wellness in Indian Country Program, um, Rural Innovations, um, which is a No Kid Hungry grant, mm -hmm. and um, the DPHHS, Montana DPHHS for Food Pharmacy. So we have those three grants on that. No Kid Hungry has been very supportive too. We got a, recently got a grant, which will help us to buy the produce and the food items we need once the uh, Farm to Families boxes stop. So, um, and then we collaborate with the school district. Um, they're um, 
Families in Transition program is helping us with funding to fuel our van so we'll be able to get to the eight outlying communities every week to provide food. Shelly, um, I'd also like to mention DOD Fresh, which is um, Katie and Aubrey, you can help me with this if I can get it wrong if you're still on here. Um, Department of Defense, it, it sounds strange, but um, it's through USDA. And um, we utilize just about every week fruit, fresh fruits and vegetables through um, DOD Fresh. So that, that's a, another way that helps on our food cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ginger, it's interesting to hear you say that buying local foods um, saves you money yes. in the long run, which is kind of the opposite of what we usually hear. We usually hear that you can't afford not to use, co you know, commodity foods. Well, commodity oh, food is is free, okay? Um, and I'm not trying to, to dismiss that at all. They do have um, hamburger, and, and I use the, the pork roast, and they're wonderful. Mm -hmm. But um, in case you don't get as much as what you would like to have for that year another option is and remember i said negotiating when it comes to buying okay so that's one thing that i actually really love to do in anything buying a car a pair i don't care what it is um so I, I i negotiate a lot when it comes to um not only our beef but um our vendors like um who's who we're buying equipment from I negotiate with them. Even department stores buying pants. <laughs> <laughs> no lie. <laughs> Kelly's, Kelly's right there with me. She, we're like two peas in a pod and sometimes we can be pretty dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> we need you guys everywhere in the state to negotiate for all of us. <laughs> Tell the difference between like the spaghetti, like you Why tell it. Hold on, Kelly's gonna speak for a minute. I was saying, like, when we're talking about saving money, you know, before before Ginger came along, when they make spaghetti, you know, I wasn't the cook then or anything, but they make spaghetti. I mean, they're opening like, I don't know, 30, 30 cans or so of spaghetti sauce. Okay. Whereas now, Ginger has this recipe where you use, and this is not gonna sound good, but it's excellent you use um, um, a little bit of oil, a little bit, a lot of, a lot of garlic, a lot of onions, you saute that, and then it's like, we you use cans. five cans of tomato paste. Mm. And then all the rest is just water. Mm -hmm. And then a little Italian seasoning. And it's, so I mean, that's a big difference in five cans of tomato paste compared to, this, and it tastes, 20 times better. You think gotcha. she's Italian. Yeah. Yeah, the seasonings matter, right? Yeah, yeah it is fun. Yeah. yeah, what are you guys seeing in terms of food waste? That's, that's fun to talk about. So used to, we didn't know what to do with our leftovers, which we try to minimize that the best we can. Now with the Oliver system, anything left over, we package it, and we freeze it and that goes in our backpack programs to the kids who need meals at night through the weekends. So every bit of that food is, is going back into those kids. Nothing is wasted. So that Oliver machine, it looks pretty cool. It is. In the photo. So what it does is it, it actually packages those meals. It does. Looks like TV trays almost. Yeah, like you'd buy a TV dinner. And so there, uh, there's a sheet of pla like plastic wrap over top of it yep yeah film yep okay yeah, there you go. thank you jenny yeah okay and and so it's going through the machine and getting some film on there it yeah. is all right yeah and then yep. you can just throw those in the freezer right right and they heat, heat them up in the microwave um and i believe uh katie bark put a link to our youtube video when we do a kitchen tour um it shows that machine in action that's great. Can can those be shared with the the larger community then? It could be. Yeah. If if I found somebody who needed it close to us, we could share it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that kind of brings me to to one of the questions I had for for all of you, 
which is, you know, as you've been implementing these grassroots programs, what are some of the broader food system or food access issues that you've run into um, as part of the implementation? Things like, I'm thinking things like availability of healthier food options, transportation, storage, those kinds of things. Um, and then how did you resolve those challenges or, or make use of opportunities that you encountered? Well, we, um, we store our frozen food in Medicine Bear's freezers when we were over there. Um, and what well, we still do because we move some over with us. And we were able to get one large freezer um, through Montana Food Bank Network through a grant that they had. So we purchased a new one. Um, cooler space, we use theirs. And so it's all home-sized freezers. And, but when we got the big loads, we filled those up. And we, um, so we moved out the uh, local grocery store, has a pallet of space that we fill up. And then we just come and get it as we need it. So they've been really gracious letting us do that. We also collaborated with our um, Browning Public Schools Child Nutrition Program and put some things in their warehouse, coolers and freezers. And um, when COVID was happening and there was, there was no one using, before they were able to do um, the meals, well, they were doing meals and they were going out and distributing them on the school buses and the Nopi school um, wasn't using their freezers in the same way. So we filled up their freezer until they got up and running again. And then we had to get out of their way because they needed their freezer space. So we run all over town and there's a Jeep that was parked out at Medicine Bear that did they been parked in the driveway. And so our folks were using their own vehicles to run all over town and haul this food, pick it up and, and that. So we were able to get the use of that Jeep. We just had to put new wipers in it and clean it up and and it doesn't, the speedometer doesn't really work, but it gets everybody around town so they don't have to use their own vehicles and so that we can move our food when we need to store it. And we were able even to use a little bit of space in the freezer at the food, Blackfeet uh, Food Distribution Program at one time because the food would land and we were like, oh my goodness. And um, so we've been able to, we have a lot of good friends and support in the community doing that. That's really great to hear. And I think Kim Kim built. Did you build a, a building or something? A storage storage building. We we did, Noni. We um everything just happened so quickly from March on, and we had all of this excess food. Sometimes we would get you know sixty or seventy or a hundred boxes that day, and then we um, because of the weather, we had a lot of snow right at the end of or at the beginning of spring, mid spring. And so we would have to uh, put everything into my refrigerator and into our house. And, and we ended up getting a, a storage shed and, and got it located next to the house. And, you know, because we were also doing um, quarantine and isolation and really strict uh, CDC safety protocols because we were delivering to such at risk um, population. And so, yeah, we, we had to purchase a storage shed and, and by the grace of the Montana Food Pantry, uh, COVID relief funds, we were able to get a larger refrigerator and freezer so that we could put those um, items that needed uh, uh, more refrigeration beyond what I had in my house. So yeah, we wow. just, it was kind of a miss, but we kept everything safe and all the food safe and just really grateful how it's all turned out. Um, Shelly, could I touch on two things real quick? Um, I saw a, a question in the chat box and uh, someone's asking about, get, uh, I think it's from Jackie. And Jackie, if you want to clarify your question a little bit, you asked about speaking on getting a school board on board. Mm. Um, I don't know if you're asking me that or not. Um, it was easy for me, I'll be honest, because we have such a good administration. We really do. Um, I understand that there is administration and school boards out there that they're going to be closed-minded to it but I think if you use numbers like from my school um, that should help um, I'm also I'd love to help anybody that needed help um, getting their their administration on board and, and moving forward with using local foods and saving money I, I would love to help with that so anybody that needs help 
just contact me. Um, the second thing I want to speak about is um, I wanted to publicly thank the First Lady, Lisa Bullock, for choosing Huntley Project um, for one of her First Lady School Nutrition Awards. That was so inspiring to me and Kelly and everybody here. I got it framed and in my office. So thank you so much. That was a huge accomplishment. And um, I was really surprised because, you know, I haven't been doing this very long. I, I cooked on a, on a guest ranch for a little while. <laughs> so um, thank you so much. Well, I think you have found a very natural fit, Ginger. <laughs> Thank you. I love it. I mean, Kelly, yeah. but it's because of who I work with. I love who I work with. It took us a while to, to my, my whole thing was I want everybody that works in this kitchen to be aligned with my vision. And those that weren't didn't have to be here. Naked negativity out the door. Right. <laughs> so um, we finally got a crew put together. And we're not, it's not a crew, it's a team. You know, I looked at myself as a coach, coaching a team. And um, that was always my dream growing up to, was to be a, a women's rodeo coach. And so uh, God didn't give me that, but he gave me something better. And I'm really thankful for it. Well, we appreciate your wrangling there in Warden and ins inspiring our whole state, Ginger. Fantastic. Go um, ahead, Noni. I just wanted to um, do, um, just make a statement. The power of Facebook and social media has been quite useful during COVID. We do um, our announcing of our times that were open and encouraging people to come and things that, thank yous for the donations we've been getting. We do that all on Facebook. And we found out that, you know, initially we have a line where people call and, and that when they're in line for a box, they call and let us know. And we found that there's a significant number of people who don't have cell phones even. So they will sometimes give boxes to three or four families in one car. You know, they, they pick up and they go and that. Um, and, um, you know, we've, we've had like this year alone, we have 590, what was it, 61 donors for that gave us $24,681. Those were just individual donors over the Facebook and the, I mean, and the website. And um, two thirds of that was just in September and October. But the other thing is the Bozeman Food Co-op gave us a really good experience. They picked us in September to be the nonprofit that they gave their donations for Apple a day to. And they asked us for videos, selfie videos and stuff. And they made a really cool video and put it out there. And, um, you know, we, we aren't used to being in that realm. And so it was a real eye-opening. We looked really good. It was, it was fun. And uh, so we're going to have to figure out, find somebody strong in the community who can do that kind of thing. And so we can do videos and stuff because there's a lot of power in that to get yourself out there. So I'm really thankful for them helping us um, do that and, and all the stuff we just sent it on the cell phone my goodness sakes we never would have thought thanks yeah there is a lot of power in that local messaging thanks we're we're two minutes to 12 so i'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up i'm going to pass it back over um to lisa but thank you so much um noni kim ginger kelly Thanks for being here today. Thanks for all you're doing, your willingness to help your colleagues out here in the state. And thanks to everybody who, who listened in to this session today. It was really great. Thank you all. Thank you. These projects are fascinating. I hope everyone watching has taken a lot of information with them to inspire more projects like this across the state. Now it's noon and we'll break for the next hour, um, take a minute to rest and uh, refresh ourselves, but feel free to disconnect and sign in again at 1 p.m. using the same Zoom link. Uh, or you can actually stay on the Zoom call as we have um, a 15 minute yoga and meditation video starting at 12.15 and another short one at 12.30 if you wanna focus on some self-care. But otherwise, enjoy your lunch and please join us for the policy focus sessions at one o'clock and there's so much more to come. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>